Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, United States of, America, of America and to, and to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's a, another great day, and we're delighted to have our special guest with us uh, at Virginia Western Community College. I am Bobby Zano, president of Virginia Western Community College, and there could be no better way to finish off this very exciting week that we've had <laughs> than to have the Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, to campus. Uh, Secretary Duncan, we are privileged to have you in Roanoke and have you here. Thank you very much. It is a true honor to have our country's top policymaker for education here, and we thank Secretary Duncan for choosing to include our college in his back-to-school bus tour. So Arnie's been moving. He's been going all around, and I'm sure he's tired, and, uh, but we're delighted to have him here. The topic for this morning's town hall discussion are indicators for college and career readiness, along with the obstacles many adult learners face. In Tuesday's scholarship announcement here at the college with the Freeland Charitable Trust, we discussed some of the challenges our region and our country are facing. We are now in a knowledge-based economy, and higher education is more important than ever for the success of our community. America's economic future depends on a skilled workforce that is developed through college degree and certificate programs. As a community college, it has always been Virginia Western's mission to make college affordable and accessible to all of the students in our region. Supporters like the Freelands and others are helping us meet that mission but it's incumbent upon our students to be engaged and step up to make the most of their opportunities. So we're always encouraging our students, step up, let's make things happen. You gotta make them happen yourself. For many of our students, college is not as simple as coming to campus and taking classes. Some people think that's all students have to do is they just come to school, take classes, and life is fine. We know that many of our students have obligations to family, work, and their community that must be balanced in order to compete or complete their assignments. As employees at Virginia Western, we must hold ourselves accountable also. We must set the bar high and help our students achieve their goals. When our students walk across the stage at commencement, we need to have the, they need to have the skills and training to become strong members of our local workforce. Their success will elevate our entire region. Our success depends upon our students' success. Today we are fortunate to have a much esteemed panel to shed some light upon the current factors affecting college and career readiness. First, Mr. Arnie Duncan is the ninth U.S. Secretary of Education. He has served in his post since being confirmed by the U.S. Senate on January 20th, 2009, following his nomination by President Barack Obama. In Secretary Duncan's tenure, he has helped secure congressional support for President Obama's investments in education, including the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Before becoming Secretary of Education, Mr. Duncan served as the Chief, Chief Executive Officer of the Chicago Public Schools from 2001 to 2008. His work background also includes running a nonprofit education foundation called the Aerial Education Initiative and playing professional basketball in Australia. This guy's a talented guy. <laughs> <laughs> Secretary Duncan uh, is a no small task here either. And let's listen to this one. Secretary Duncan graduated magna cum laude from Harvard University in 1987. He was co-captain of Harvard's basketball team and just happened to be named a first-team academic All-American. So congratulations. <laughs> Dr. Brenda Dan Massier is the Assistant Secretary for Vocational and Adult Education with the U.S. Department of Education. Dr. Messier leads the country's efforts in adult education and career and technical education, as well as efforts supporting community colleges and correctional education. She oversees the administration of 11 grant programs in these areas, totaling approximately $1.9 billion annually. Professor Brenda Ashcroft is an assistant professor reading at Virginia Western. She began her career teaching elementary school and continues to move and continued to move through K-12 and into her current career at the college. Professor Ashcroft's knowledge of developmental education has made her an asset 
to the Virginia Community College system during the developmental education restructuring that the system is now do go going through. She understands the challenges, trials, and successes from firsthand experience with all these steps of the educational system. Mr. John Williamson III is currently Chairman, President, and CEO of RGC Resources, a NASDAQ-listed company and parent of Roanoke Gas Company. He has formerly served in government executive capacities, including as County Administrator for Botetourt and Nelson Counties. Mr. Williamson is a Virginia Western alumnus who has previously served as President of the College Educational Foundation Board of Directors. He holds a B.S. in Business Administration and Management from Virginia Commonwealth University and an MBA from the College of William & Mary. Mr. Williamson is here to share with us his experiences as an industry leader in the region and his thoughts on what role higher education has in driving the local economy. Please give a round of applause to all of our panelists for agreeing to share their expertise. Now I will turn it over to Secretary Duncan for his comments. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. Before I begin, can we have a huge round of applause for Dr. Sandal for his leadership and everything he does? It has been a fascinating two-week bus tour, and I'm looking forward to getting home to D.C. Uh, tonight. Uh, but starting in Silicon Valley, have traveled from West Coast to, to the East Coast. And whether it's early childhood education, whether it's high school, middle schools, four-year institutions, here in Amazing Community College, it's been an inspiring, inspiring trip. And you see the challenges folks are facing, but you see how hard everyone's working. And the message we're trying to you know, emphasize, and re-emphasize, and people get it, is that we have to educate our way to a better economy. That's the only way we're going to get there. And the biggest joys of my job is frankly getting outside of Washington, going to hundreds and hundreds of schools. And I have to tell you, I say this all the time, I think my most inspiring visits are often to community colleges. And whether you have 18-year-olds, whether you have 13-year-olds, 38-year-olds, whether you have 58-year-olds, you guys represent the best of what our country is. It's often a baby United Nations, people from all walks of life, many, many different languages spoke. This traditional versus non-traditional, there is no such thing anymore. The non-traditional is the norm now. And people balancing, as Dr. Sandler talked about, careers, families, community work, and still finding a way to come back to school to take the next step up the economic ladder. And everyone here knows, I know I'm preaching the choir, that our country and the world has fundamentally changed. Um, jobs that used to exist 10, 20, 30 years ago, many of those are frankly gone and they're not coming back. And so whether it's advanced manufacturing, IT jobs, healthcare jobs, green energy jobs, all of us have to constantly be learning throughout our adult lives, and we have to be going back to school and to community college to get those skills to take that next step up. So I just want to thank you and your team for the remarkable service that you're providing uh, to this community, uh, to this region. We set this bus tour up a long time ago. We didn't know you were about to get a TAA grant. Didn't know you were about to get a, a bunch of new scholarship money. But I think it's just a recognition of the leadership here and the huge difference that you're making in people's lives. So thank you so much. Our team just wants to be a good partner. And we've tried to shine an unprecedented spotlight on community colleges. I think as families get back on their feet, the country should get back on its feet. Community colleges, I think, are playing a vital, vital role in that effort. Uh, we're doing everything we can to invest resources, whether it's a TA grants in partnership with the Department of Labor, $2 billion, $500 million in the past three years now, another $500 million next year, where real training are leading to real jobs in the private sector, true public-private partnerships. We've fought so hard to increase Pell Grants, a $40 billion increase in Pell Grants over the next decade without going back to taxpayers for a nickel. We simply stopped subsidizing banks, put all that money into young people. We thought that was common sense. That was wildly controversial in Washington. Um, but as we were talking, you know, just backstage for a moment, we're thrilled with that. But these are hard-fought victories. But these are ones we can't sort of just sort of rest on our laurels. And there are folks who think of education as an, as an expense not as an investment. We think of it as an investment. So you have people who want to scale back on Pell Grants, who want to scale back on college access. And I just think we desperately need a more educated workforce, not a less educated workforce. The North Star for all of our work is to lead the world in college graduation rates again. We think if we do that, we'll have a very strong country. We'll keep jobs, and jobs can go wherever the knowledge workers are, not just in this country, but around the globe. We'll keep jobs in this country. 
We used to be first in the world in college graduation rates, and today we're 14th. So 13 other countries have passed us by. And we feel a huge sense of urgency to get better and to again become first in the world. That's what the President has challenged us to do. As we try and do that, other countries aren't just sitting back saying, let the U.S. pass us by. They are investing. They are being creative. They are being innovative. And so this is not one where this is going to be an easy climb. It's an ambitious goal. To get there, we obviously need a lot more 17 and 18 year olds graduating from high school. We've got to reduce those dropout rates. We have to make sure they're not just graduating, but graduating college and career ready. Do um, you have any sense what percent of your students need remedial classes coming here? So a third, that's not atypical. So that's a third of young people who are graduating, but honestly, they're not ready. And we've got to get you guys out of the catch-up business and make sure we're doing a better job on the K-12 side. We're working hard on that. But for, uh, uh, for us to hit the President's goal, we have to reduce those dropout rates. We have to increase graduation rates. We have to make sure those high school graduates are college and career ready. We simply can't begin to hit that goal if we don't bring back the adult learners from across the country. And so we're working very, very hard, Brendan and her team, to make sure those 25-year-olds, those 35-year-olds, those 55-year-olds, those 65-year-olds have the tools and the abilities and the pathway to come back and to retrain and retool and get the skills they need to compete and to keep a good job, a high-wage job in this new knowledge-based economy. So we've completed, and Brenner will talk more about it, this Adult College Completion Toolkit. This is online. It's hot off the press. I uh, just got my copy this morning. But we want to be a good partner. Again, whether it's Pell Grants, whether it's looking at dual enrollment, whether it's making sure that uh, we continue to invest through the TA program with the Department of Labor, we just want to support the good work that you guys are doing. So look forward to a great Q&A. Please ask the hard questions. Please challenge us to be a good partner. Our only goal in life is to have you guys be wildly successful and continue to make the difference that you are. I'll stop there. Thanks so much. Thrilled to bring up Brenda Dan Messier. She, this is her lifelong passion. She's an absolute superstar on our team. I feel so lucky to have her. She'll talk to you a little bit about her background and what she's trying to do. But she's brought a level of commitment and enthusiasm to, to this work that I think is going to take the, our efforts nationally to an entirely different well, uh, level. Please give a warm, a warm round of applause to Dr. Brenda Van Messier. Thank you very much, Secretary Duncan. I'm really thrilled that you were able to announce the release of our uh, toolkit today as part of your bus tour. And uh, President Sandel, I really wanted to thank you also for hosting us here today on your campus. And congratulations, it's been a mon <coughs> monumental week for you, and we're happy to be here. Yes, we did, and I was just going to also say thank you very much for organizing a roundtable. We had adult students. Would you please, those of you, I want to shout out, give you a shout out. Well, those of you that participate in the roundtable, please raise your hand. Arnie, these, these, these are remarkable adult education students who uh, were laid off, hadn't been to school for 20, 30 years, some of them veterans, and they've come back to school because they know they need to acquire the skills and knowledge to fully compete in today's economy. And I just wanted to say to all of you, you're really inspiring and an inspiration to all of us. Keep on doing the hard work that you're doing. And I know that you'll reach your dreams. And I know they'll be able to reach their dreams because they've had tremendous support from the president's office on down to the faculty and staff. Repeatedly, one after another, the students talked about the support they were getting, the sometimes in your face intrusive counseling that Dan was uh, doing with his students. But it's important. They all felt that they were able to rely on the faculty and staff to make it through the program. So kudos to all of the faculty and staff here for just doing an outstanding job supporting the students. And uh, prior to coming to the Department of Education, I was the president of an adult and family learning center in Providence, Rhode Island. And over 13 years ago, the first program that I established was a college preparatory program for low-skilled adults because I knew that they needed to aspire to more than a GED. They needed to aspire to a post-secondary degree. And so when I came to the department, I said, I remembered all the struggles our students had as they were transitioning from adult education to college. I said to the staff, let's put together a toolkit so we can really encourage more adult students to transition to post-secondary education. And I want to recognize two of my staff that are here, Sue Lu and Chris Carr, and ask them to stand. They're the chief architects of this uh, toolkit. And, uh, I <clears throat> 
really want to thank them. And as the secretary said, all of our work in the Office of Vocational Adult Education, I'm the assistant secretary for that office, I have the best portfolio in all of the department. Not only do I get to work with youth in school and out of school, but I get to work with adult students. And so I feel really pleased to be able to lead the Office of Vocational and Adult Education. And all of our work is guided by the President's 2020 goal that the Secretary mentioned. We want to make sure that we're preparing all of our students um, for post-secondary education. Sixty percent of the jobs in 2018 are going to require some form of post-secondary education. So it's incumbent that all of our youth and adults uh, transition to higher education. And this toolkit focuses on access issues, quality issues, and completion. It's not enough to enroll in college. We have to make sure that they complete with an industry-recognized certificate, post-secondary certificates or credentials, and a degree. And again, President Sandel, the staff that you're providing your students here enables them to complete and be successful. And so this toolkit is uh, written for statewide administrators, and we have our Department of Education colleagues from the, from the Virginia State Department of Education here. They've been great partners with us in this work. We also have uh, information strategies, resources, and tools in this for adult education practitioners, and there are also sections for adult students, students who are transitioning from adult basic education to college. We have a section for our returning veterans. We have a section for skilled immigrants who've come into this country uh, very skilled but ha find it difficult to go back to work in their profession. And then we also have a section in here for folks who are incarcerated or recently released to assist them to go to college. Because as I mentioned before, when I worked with adult students, there are lots of obstacles. And they can be overcome with information, with strategies, with tools, and with support. And so we hope you'll find this toolkit useful. It's online at www.ed.gov. And then just click onto the Office of Vocational Adult Education. It's a live document. We want your feedback, your uh, your information where we might be able to improve it so it continue, can continue to serve all of you. So thank you, President Sandel, for the wonderful work you and your staff are doing here. And to the adult students, I know you will be successful. You've already proven to overcome so many obstacles. Good luck and whatever we can do to partner with you so can you continue to be successful, it's our privilege to do so. Thank you. Brenda? <laughs> It's such a pleasure to be with you today to share one of our great successes here at Virginia Western. At Virginia Western Community College, we have led the state and are currently leading the nation as well with our integrated developmental English course design. This design represents the epitome of forward thinking in that it examines the natural links to skills that will lead students from successful course completion to college work and work readiness. Our best practices language immersion model addresses not only verbal skills, but also information management, test taking strategies, and approaches to learning. After analyzing the profile of the developmental student, we concluded that our course design needed another dimension. This dimension needed to consider more than content and skills. It needed to be broader and bolder. Consequently, we embedded an assistive advising component which allows the instructor to make supportive interventions to prevent failure and or withdrawal. The final aspect to our unique model provides students with the opportunity to formulate realistic career goals as well as to devise a plan to meet those goals. In addition, by adding a college survival skills credit course with our developmental English, we assist students with the navigation of campus resources and we have an opportunity to survey the community to bring outside resources to the student. This course design provides the student with opportunities to develop the college and career ready proficiencies that he or she will need in today's competitive world. And from my perspective, to be college and career ready, students will read documents and text with precision, continuously expand their vocabularies, Apply the writing process to produce clear and concise documents. Effectively manage and reduce information to its key components. Demonstrate the quick and accurate recall of basic mathematical concepts. 
problem solve and create by manipulating verbal and mathematical languages. Separate fact from opinion and make logical inferences. Understand the differences between formal and informal languages and the appropriate settings for both. Promptly meet deadlines. Demonstrate an awareness of professional ethics. Learn from their mistakes and not fear failure. Skillfully use technology to communicate, to problem solve, and to create, but display the wisdom to know when to step away from technology to think and to reflect. In conclusion, I would like to quote Steve Jobs, who said in 2008 in a commencement speech at Stanford University, your work is going to fill a large part of your life, and the only way to be truly satisfied is to do great work. We want our students to do great work. Thank you. I'm John Williamson, President and CEO of RGC Resources, and after listening to Brenda, I don't know that I have anything to add. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, what I was going to say, uh, and I, I think she said it very well, uh, from an employer's perspective, uh, and in terms of, I guess I've been interviewing and hiring people for longer than I want to admit, but it's, it's almost 40 years. It's been a long time. By the way, I started here, and my first class was a remedial math class at 8 o'clock in the morning. So I, I know from which you speak, but uh, the key, uh, I think, from an employer and what employers are looking for and what this college can do uh, for students and what students can do for themselves is to remember that in terms of getting a job and being successful early in a job, uh, you know, the technical skills are important, but folks, it's really about being able to communicate, being able to verbally and in writing clearly communicate uh, that people understand you, that they appreciate what you have to say, uh, that you have good listening skills. I just can't, I don't, I don't know how to, to uh, you can't overemphasize those issues. Uh, and, and the remedial work that you're talking about, uh, I think, is just key to that. Uh, if you're a student in an IT program uh, or engineering or whatever it is, take as much English and writing and speaking classes or take a drama class, whatever it is, anything that helps you in, in verbal skills uh, and in written skills. Uh, they are the gateway uh, to getting hired in the first place, and then they make all the difference about whether you advance or not because if, if, if you, people don't understand you because you don't communicate well or if you write poorly, it doesn't matter if your IQ is 130 uh, and you're highly productive. If you, if you can't get that across in verbal and written communications, it just doesn't matter. So remember to take that English class, uh, take a speech class, think about developing those skills. Uh, they're as important as the engineering class or the calculus class or any of those. Uh, a couple of good news things. I think the uh, employers in this region really respect this institution. Uh, particularly in the last eight or ten years since Dr. Sandel has shown up. This, this, community's gone, this community college has gone from being sort of a quiet little secret to uh, a jewel asset in the region and the business community is recognizing that. I think the $5 million gift that was received earlier this week uh, in support of scholarships is, is indicative of that. Uh, I'm serving on an interregional group called the um, Innovation Blueprint today that's, uh, its, its purpose is to try to improve the entrepreneurial atmosphere around here for uh, young people, and not necessarily just young people, but people interested in starting a business uh, and growing businesses and creating intellectual property and wealth in this region. Uh, and, and one of the key aspects of that program uh, is, actually two of them are, one is workforce readiness focused on STEM uh, and then the other one is higher ed uh, interaction with the business community uh, and making sure that what's happening in the business community is in sync with what uh, is happening in the higher ed community and the two are talking to each other. Uh, the other good news is, uh, like me, I'm in my late 50s and a lot of the workforce in this community is in that same space. There are going to be a lot of retirees. There's going to be I think a significant uh, shortage of technical and sort of associate degree 
uh, certificate degree types of uh, employees in the region. So stick with your program. Uh, and in not too distant future, old guys like me will get out of the way and there'll be a lot of jobs. Thank you. Look forward to your questions. Yeah, I want to thank our panelists for their insights. Uh, now we're going to open the discussion uh, to the group, to the audience. And we've got a mic down here and over here. Um, and remember what the Secretary said, ask the hard questions. And Mr. Secretary, we do have some superintendents here with us today, and we have some business people and students and uh, a pretty uh, varied group of folks. So you may get a, a different variety of questions. And that's what he wants, and that's what the panel wants. So first question over here. Thank you very much for coming. Um, Dr. Uh, Dan Messier, it's almost like Christmas for me right now, and I'm salivating. You, you mentioned uh, a project there, and I just want you to expand a little bit more about what you have coming up for the veterans with your new package. Certainly. Um, first of all, I wanted to let you know, Arnie, this is a fellow Rhode Islander. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to be able to make that connection here in Virginia. Um, well, we know it's really important to make sure that our veterans that are coming back uh, from providing tremendous service to our country have access to all the educational opportunities so they can succeed. And that we can also make sure that the experiences that they gained in the military, um, they receive credit. So we're working with our colleagues in Veterans Affairs to make sure that there's a great connection, that we're welcoming back our veterans, and that we're providing them tons of opportunities so they can continue their education and get the good jobs that are going unfilled today. And so if you've got some specific suggestions, Roberto, of some services that you know veterans need, please share those with us. But um, I think one of the real hallmarks of the Obama administration is interagency work. And so we're working very closely with all of our uh, Department of Defense, Department of Veterans Affairs to make sure that we have provide access to educational opportunities for our veterans when they're returning, and also while they're serving in the military. I don't know if you wanted to add anything, Secretary Duncan. No, I, obviously, I just think we owe that community so much we can't do enough so whatever we can do to provide opportunity whatever we can do frankly to make sure they're not exploited when they come back or taking classes that are very expensive and not leading towards real jobs on both sides of the equation we need to look at that and again whatever services we're not providing or they're missing uh, we need to hear that and we probably have around 500 veterans who take advantage of the college at this time next question uh, one of the things, Mr. Sector, uh, Secretary, you may not have heard uh, is that Virginia Western is doing a, a demonstration program in the Western Virginia Regional Jail on high-level computer training uh, for inmates there under a U.S. Uh, justice grant. Uh, we have the highest incarceration rate of any uh, Western democracy. Uh, and the fact is that the greatest uh, indicator of success is ability to get a job. And I know from spending lots of time as a, as a volunteer in the, in the jails <laughs> that, um, that, you know, there's, people are sitting around. And I want to know what, what you envision in terms of long-range strategy to make that, those opportunities for training in, in prisons available. Yeah, I'll start and turn it to Brenda because she actually has an interagency group working on this. But first of all, I just want to thank you for your, your volunteer efforts. And uh, when I ran Chicago Public Schools, for better or worse, we actually ran two schools in jails. One sort of more for adults and one, frankly, for very young kids. It was heartbreaking. And we know the only way to make sure that folks don't go back to where they came from um, and continue that kind of behavior, we have to train them. And there are very, very few college graduates locked up today, like almost none. And the link between education and poverty and social failure we know is extraordinary. And um, there are lots of folks in there who are bright, who are committed, who just haven't had the opportunity. And so you and others coming in to give them real skills that will give them an alternative to a life in the streets when they come back out is hugely important. And we know the, recidiv the recidivism rates here locally across the country are exponentially high, unacceptably high. And so if you guys can show us how your training is leading to folks stepping out of that, that life and moving into a very different one, that's a huge deal. And I know how tough that work is. Do you want to talk about specifically what Certainly. we're doing on the interagency side to try and be a good partner? Sure. 
Um, Attorney General Holder has convened a cabinet level uh, group to work on issues confronting folks when they re-enter our society. And so we're mirroring that process in the Department of Education and bringing of all of our colleagues together to make sure that not only are we providing services while folks are incarcerated, youth and adults, that they were also providing services them when they exit. Because 95% of the folks who are incarcerated are coming back to our community. And we need to make sure they have the skills and education so they can fully participate in the economy once they're released. So we think it's a two-pronged approach, sir, that we're providing strong educational services while they're incarcerated, and then also to make sure that we make the connection for folks when they leave the institutions to community resources. When I was in Providence, I served folks while they were incarcerated, and then again when they came out. And it was important for them to know that they, they knew who they could come to, where they could go, where they saw familiar faces, they knew the faculty, they knew the case managers. So it's really important to engage the whole community when folks exit so that they don't just go back into meeting up with uh, their friends and maybe not having access to job training services. But you know, there are limited services available in corrections institutions today, so we're working very hard to try to change that. And it's part of our proposal to, re to reauthorize the Workforce Investment Act. We want to increase the funding for correctional education because we know that there are a lot of folks who are wasting time while they're incarcerated and not getting the education and training. We want to make sure it's not just the academic program, but the technical skills and the employability skills. So folks are acquiring all three. Okay, thank you. Question over here. First of all, I'd just like to say thank you for being here. I do appreciate your presence. Um, the second thing is there is a woman that works in financial aid. Her name is Michelle Hiltz, and she is the one that submitted my name for the roundtable discussion. Um, having never been party to that, I asked her what the format was. Um, one of the things that we discussed set me on a journey. I had to go seek out and, and do a little research on my own. She is uh, uh, the director of the Veterans Financial Aid. Um, I went and spoke to several veterans, and my mother also is Michelle Hiltz, but at Germana, outside of D.C. Um, without knowing it, I actually was involved in this issue because I am not a veteran, never been a veteran. Um, what she was kind of looking for was a separate area, perhaps, with the new buildings for veterans to go and just kind of decompress. Um, and I'm wondering what the possibilities are, because I have a very good friend of mine, his name is Lynn, he's still active in the Marine Corps, and once a year, they send him to Georgia for suicide training. Yeah. What I'm wondering is, if this is a possibility, and if so, could it be a pilot for other community colleges across the nation? Thank you. I would just say this. Uh, I think that the issue of veterans and what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, position ourselves to put more resources into the veterans area because I agree with what you're talking about. And Michelle has been a really a leader at this college to be the spokesperson for veterans. And we are listening to her. We're trying to work to uh, come to a consensus as far as where we could have a certain area just for veterans where they could go and just decompress, as you say, have a place to relax uh, and talk to some of their other veterans. So. Uh, that's on our agenda, uh, and this college is, is going to address that. I, I can promise you that. So that's a very good question. Uh, our veteran enrollment continues to increase. We're going to have to make some different things happen. Great question. Thank you. If, if I could quickly add just one plug for your 500 veterans, lots of great careers out there. I'd like to remember to think about teaching. And uh, we need, as you know, we need the next generation of folks to come into the classroom. <laughs> We need more men, we need more men of color, we need a more diverse workforce. The military is a great training ground for that. Obviously the leadership and the skills you've acquired in the military, I think uniquely position you to go in the classroom. If you've been to Iraq and Afghanistan, a bunch of 13 and 14 and 15 year olds aren't gonna scare you too much, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> we need more great teachers, we need great, more great coaches, more great role models, and I just would really encourage the military veterans to think about a career in the classroom. It's a, it's a remarkable way to make a difference and give back. Yeah. Terrific. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, I had the fortune and <clears throat> ability, I mean, I had the good fortune to be a part of both of these forums. And one question that I haven't seen come up yet is, 
Will the government offer incentives to keep businesses from outsourcing to a cheaper and less educated workforce? I mean, the more education we get, well, it only stands to reason that you gotta pay us more. I mean, you already said that, you know, you make so much more per month with this degree and that degree, and the higher up you go, the more expensive your services are. And I've seen that because going through the program, the horticulture program here, I'm constantly being told that you need to get, you know, X amount of dollars to pay the bills and all of this. I mean, we have an excellent teaching source right here. But I fit the veterans, I fit the incarcerated, I fit, at one point it was homeless. So I've come a long way with the help of Virginia Western. Mm -hmm. And I've had a lot of jobs in the past, so my job record isn't all that great. So I'm looking forward to going into business. But as a small business, eh, you can hardly afford to pay the top dollar that people are gonna be requiring, you know, to match their education and experience. So a veteran, like myself, I mean, I hardly think anybody could pay me what I'm worth right now. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna be honest with you, okay? I've got a couple of years of college and 10 plus years experience in landscaping and all of that. With all of that said, what can the government do to stop these bigger companies from outsourcing most of the bulk of their work? I'm not gonna pick on Walmart, but I guess they're part of it. But any of these companies to re, you know, outsourcing most of the bulk of their labor to other countries? So it's, it's a great question. I have an easy answer to it. And I know there have been conversations about the things, and I don't set the economic policy for the administration, um, but happy to sort of take that back and have that considered. A couple things. There are, there are some companies that have been outsourcing that are now finding it is cheaper and more productive to insource. So there's been some movement back to this country. Now, maybe not as much as we would like or as fast as we would like. Um, but there's been, without any, frank, any uh, incentives, they're starting to think that's a better economic case, more value to bring those jobs back. So that's a very interesting trend. The other thing, John, I don't know if this is your sense, just sort of bigger picture stepping back in, in tough uh, economic times, I continue to ask the question, do we have a, a, a jobs crisis or do we have a skills crisis? And I have to tell you, I've met with many, many CEOs, as has the president, who say we don't want to outsource. We want to keep the jobs here, and we as employers simply can't find the employees to fill these jobs. And I'm always stunned that in you know, these real tough times, we have about two million high-wage, high-skilled jobs right now in this country that we can't fill. And so again, I think that the training that you're doing, the services that this college and so many colleges are providing around the country, I think are critical in closing that skills crisis. I don't know if that jives with your experience or not, but. Well, yeah, I, I think it does, and, and just a, from a philosophical standpoint, I don't want to sound too much like a capitalist here, but <laughs> um, from a productivity standpoint and from a raising uh, quality of life standpoint, and creating wealth, and et cetera, um, labor really needs, or the assignment of labor functions really need to be tracked to the lowest cost provider. I mean, if, if you really believe in economic theory, if it's cheaper to outsource, then you outsource to that low cost labor. Now, hopefully you're providing an opportunity, in, in, in this case it's in a foreign country, or if it's in an, another low income, lower wage state, whatever it happens to be, that's providing opportunity there. The key, I think, to your question uh, is that we develop and have policies that create the opportunity for higher level job create, creation and folks that are getting those educations uh, and have those skills and that experience are given an opportunity to make a higher wage and a better standard of living by being engaged in a higher product, productive function or job capacity. So it gets back to job creation and, and uh, opportunities and in particular skills. I, I think it's, there are a lot of uh, of unfilled jobs in this country because of the skills gap. Uh, so we're not doing enough in the way of retraining. Uh, you know, you know, the, the disruption of the, the last great recession and then all that's going on in globalization and uh, productivity change and technology, it's sort of a wrenching time in some ways, both here and globally in terms of what it's doing to the workforce and 
and how well we're responding to it as a workforce and as an education system. Uh, it's an extremely complex question. But I do want to say, having met you this morning, that I, it sounds like you're taking advantage of every single opportunity that's available to you here at the college to make the connections, to find out about the workplace, and let folks know about the great skills that you have. Yeah. The last quick thing is trying to open a business. Uh, Brenda talked about sort of the, inter, the uh, interagency partnerships. The SBA, Karen Mills, has been an amazing partner. I don't know if you've contacted them or had uh, any uh, conversation, but we'd love to make that connection for you if that'd sure. be helpful. Well, I, I've had a couple of other resources here locally, um, and one of them has already been up here, Mr. Ted Eckley. Uh, yeah. His organization has been very instrumental in helping me to get, you know, to get from point zero to where I am now, and also they have some opportunities for people to go further. So uh, I want to thank him for everything that him and his organization has done because for, with Virginia Cares and TAP, that has been a very instrumental part combined with the college. Um, there's also SCORE, and there, there's a lot of resources here in Roanoke that I found out. So, and you know, it's there. I just wonder what the possibilities are of keeping a highly skilled workforce when people want to look for cheaper labor. Yeah, got it, got it. Don't stop, keep going. Keep going. <laughs> My question is for Secretary Duncan. My name is DeAnthony Pierce. I'm currently a student here at Virginia Western. Uh, Secretary Duncan, uh, a recent response on the website for the National Center of Education and Statistics in concerns to uh, current college tuition trends. Um, between the years of 2000 and 2011, uh, undergraduate tuition uh, for room and board in public institutions has rose 42% and prices for private, not-for-profit institutions rose 31%. Recently published this month by the uh, uh, Bureau Census, uh, the Census for Bureau, um, on a report uh, called Income, Poverty, Health Insurance Coverage in the United States, the real median household income is 8.9% lower than the median household income peak that occurred in 1999. So my question, Secretary Duncan, is what is being done on behalf of the Department of Education or what has been done or what is proposed to be done to curtail the hike in college tuition and also will there be anything done to curtail the interest rate of private uh, non-Stafford loans as well. A couple of great questions. You're way ahead of where I was in college. Holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and answer as best I can. Um, so that is probably the biggest concern I hear as I travel the country is the cost of college education. And not just in disadvantaged communities and middle class communities. And lots of folks are starting to think that college isn't for them. It's for rich people. It's for people not like them. And that's a huge concern to me. Again, our fundamental goal is to lead the world in college graduation rates. And we think there's huge, you know, better workforce, there's huge benefits for the country if we do that. But if people start to think they can't afford college and not go, that's a real concern. Um, just one quick example. I was in Iowa not too long ago uh, at a high school, not at a community college. Just talk, a young girl came up afterwards. She's a senior in high school. She happens to have a twin brother. And she said her family was right then trying to decide which twin to send to college. They couldn't send both. That was the real dinnertime conversation, is does she or her brother go to college? That's just unacceptable, but that's real. So I'll tell you what we've tried to do and where we're going. I talked about the $40 billion increase in Pell Grants. We think that's a huge deal. And we've gone from about 6 million Pell recipients just two years ago to 10 million, almost 10 million now. It's more than a 50% increase. And that's 4 million folks, many first-generation college goers, who would not be in college were it not for that increase. Um, Congress is pretty dysfunctional these days. We know that. The one thing they did get passed, the president fought so hard for this, the vice president, was to keep Stafford interest rates from doubling. Now, that didn't make the problem better. It prevented the problem from getting worse. But that was a step in the right direction. Lots of folks thought that would never happen. Um, we're going to continue to do everything we can to increase Pell Grants, to stay with them. Um, but to be really clear, we can't do this by ourselves. And I always talk about shared responsibility. So why is tuition up across the country? Many states have cut their funding for education. And this isn't a political issue. This is Republican and Democrats. 
Last year, 40 states cut funding to higher ed. And when states cut funding to higher ed, what does higher ed do? They boost their tuition. They pass on the cost of students. And so I think it's just so important, again, regardless of politics or ideology, that people in part vote based upon who's going to fund education, higher ed, K-12, to early childhood, I'd add as well. And uh, I always ask, I, so I met with the National Governors Association, all the governors, and I challenged them hard, they have to invest. And I always ask the question, so 80% of you cut funding for higher ed, how many of you cut funding for corrections, for locking people up? Somehow we prefer to lock people up at 30, 40, 50, 60 grand per year than educate them right on the front end. So. So states have to invest, and the final thing is universities have to become more efficient. I think community colleges do a remarkable job of this. Um, not all, but many. I think many four-year institutions need to do a better job of keeping costs down and using technology in, in different ways. And also, this is so important, we're going to talk about building cultures not just around access, but around completion. The goal is not to go to school, the goal is to graduate, whether it's from a two-year or four-year. And so, us stepping up, continuing to provide funding, states have to do a better job but we need leadership from the public to encourage political leaders to do the right thing, and then universities have to be more effective and efficient. The final thing I'll say is, for all the challenges, I'm still absolutely convinced we have the best system of higher education in the world, by far. What we haven't had is enough, frankly, competitive pressure. And so many young people apply to one school, rather than looking at two and three and four, and looking at who offers the financial aid package. So we've done a lot recently to try and increase transparency, and allow people to comparison shop and figure out you know, what's a grant? What's a loan? What's the best situation for me? Just basic information has been pretty opaque. It's been pretty difficult for people to navigate. And so we're hoping with greater transparency that good actors will be rewarded. Bad actors won't. <laughs> good actors will get more customers, more students coming their way. Uh, one university uh, just last week, uh, just one example, Concordia College in, uh, in Minnesota, they cut their tuition 10 grand in tough economic time. Now that's a very difficult decision to make. That's a real profile on courage. That's real leadership. So we try to publicize the good stuff they're doing and hope a lot more students think about that kind of option. So not a simple answer, but to me it comes back to shared responsibility. We have to step up, hold us accountable. States have to step up and invest. Universities have to become more efficient and more productive. Thank you very much. Right before I get to you, I want to ask Brenda Ashcroft one question. Does the new English work you are doing in the developmental area, do you see that as leading to greater retention among those students, students who are taking that. I mean, is, is this an English procedure that they're really t tying into, that they see the value of it, they, are they staying the course and, and remaining in school? Absolutely. In fact, our entire uh, course design, the philosophy <coughs> behind that is to embrace the student academically, socially, and emotionally, and to provide all the support we can to those students. They're here and we want to retain them and we want them to be successful. And our whole state model is based on retention and success of those students. And we have a couple more questions to go. Thank you, Brenda. Yes, ma'am. I just want to start by saying hello to you all. Um, I'm myself, I'm a veteran, and Virginia Western met all of my needs. I graduated in May, last May, with my degree in legal administration. So Virginia Western Community College was awesome for me. On the second fold, I am a mother of a high school sophomore and she was attending the Upper Bound program at Roanoke College. That program has since lost its funding. And we understand that K through 12 is the foundation for getting good college students ready and into the workforce. So what can be done to reinstate the grants for specifically the Roanoke College Upper Bound program that's been cut that prepares students for college? So we all have to continue to invest. And again, we're in really tough economic times trying to lead by example. And President flatlined the rest of domestic spending and asked for a $1.7 billion increase in our budget because he sees it as an investment, not an expense. So we have to continue to invest in whether it's Upper Bound, a TRIO, or whatever it might be. I think those kinds of programs, the dual enrollment programs, I know you do a lot where high school students are getting college credit. That is a huge deal. We can't do enough of that for a whole host of reasons. Um, but you may not know, our funding K-12 at the federal level is usually 8 to 10 percent of the total funding. Usually about half comes from the state, usually about 40% comes local. So again, it's something that at every level, local, state, and federal, we need to continue to invest in education. And again, please hold us accountable for doing that. She's, she's taken AP courses. Yeah. 
courses and right. she's really you know really into her schoolwork but it's so competitive now yeah. Yeah. and colleges are starting to look at them their sophomore year mm -hmm. and if they're not in these programs to, to prepare them for college they're not going to be able to compete with student B who's been through these programs and who's you know other countries who may be a little bit more educated than we are so that's just a concern that a parent of a high schooler I have. No, it's, it's hugely important as you start to think about how to pay for college. We have a great new website. Please come check it out, studentaid.gov. We just revamped it and lots of information, lots of opportunities out there. And even though she's a sophomore, it's not too early at all right. to start to think about it. And, and don't you. underestimate how you'll be a role model for her. Uh, this young woman will become a judge. Uh, that's her aspiration. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. One more question over here. I'm a recent South Carolina public high school graduate. <clears throat> I moved here to for myself <laughs> in Virginia. and. In math class, I hear the phrase, you may have seen this in high school, and I have no idea what he's talking about. I feel disadvantaged coming from another state, and it's almost as if the current system pits students from states against each other. Is there any support from a federal level to federalize public school standards or standardized tests to help bring students together as opposed to pit them against each other to further future generations? That's a great question. That's a complicated question. <laughs> um, no, it's really, really important. So I think if we do it from the federal level and mandate it, it actually doesn't work. And education has always been largely a local issue. What we have seen is uh, we had a, a race at the top, some incentives out there, significant incentives for states to raise standards. And historically what we had is every state did different things. And some states dummied down their standards. You coming from one of those states, quite frankly. Yeah and it puts you and others at a competitive disadvantage and it's not fair, it's not good for the states. When people dummied down standards, they were lying to students and lying to parents, but it made politicians look good. That's why that happened. And what you've seen is this huge profile of courage. And over the past couple years, you've seen 46 states raise standards voluntarily, not a mandate, a mandate from me, I think it doesn't work. 46 states raising standards, college and career ready standards that are internationally benchmarked. It's a much higher bar, it's gonna be tougher to get there Teachers have to teach in a different way. Students have to understand what's at stake for them. Parents have to be educated. It's a big step in the right direction. One quick example, uh, Tennessee. Tennessee is one of the states that had lower standards. They raised them, just so, show, so what a big difference it made. My numbers won't be exact. I think it was like fourth grade uh, math. But before they were saying that 91% of students were proficient, when they raised standards, it went from 91% to 38%. And achievement gaps that were already large doubled. That takes courage, but guess what? For the first time, they were telling the truth. That was leveling the playing field and saying where folks are at. and gives you a place to move from. So um, unfortunately, there are many students like you around the country, including my home state of Illinois, the dummy down standards, but you have a real movement now. I think it's gonna be a choppy couple of years. It's gonna be hard for teachers and students and principals and parents, but if we can stay the course and have the courage to do the right thing, I'm just convinced this is an absolute game changer. In two, three, four years from now, we as a country will be in a very different place. Your point's really well taken. You're not competing for jobs in your community or in South Carolina or in this country. You're competing for jobs with children, young people in India and in China and South Korea and Singapore. And I'm just convinced our young people here are as smart, as talented, as creative, as entrepreneurial as children anywhere in the world. We need to level the playing field. We need to give you a chance to compete. And so I think are some incentives from us rather than mandates and some real leadership at the state level, I think that's the right combination to get this done. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, you have a. Uh, all right, See, one this more. woman's been okay. waiting for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> and who's? Let's do two more quick, sorry. Do two, two real quick. Hi. Um, this question actually isn't from me, it's from the young lady up the stairs in the wheelchair. She right, can't get down here and answer yep. that question. Um, she wants to know what is being done about uh, people with disabilities with low income that are trying to go into college and what is being done about helping them get jobs. That's so what she wants I'm happy that we can sort of talk offline on this, trying to do a ton of work to make sure that we are increasing access. One of the real success stories over the past 20, 30 years is a huge increase in young people with disabilities graduating from high school and going on to college. So there's been a real, there's been real progress, but the numbers are nowhere near where we want them to be. So happy to talk, you, talk with you a little bit more offline about what we're trying to do to make sure people with disabilities, particularly young people with low income, come from low income communities with disabilities, 
have a chance to take that next step up the economic and educational ladder. Yes, ma'am. Um, hi there. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm the PTA president at my son's school just down the road here in Roanoke County. We have great schools here, and one of them uh, was just made a blue ribbon school. However, I'm not speaking on behalf of the PTA today, uh, just as a concerned parent, but as PTA president, many people in this community share their concerns with me. Uh, they're upset that our schools are underfunded. We have a $12 million shortfall in Roanoke County, and we're facing losing almost half a million more due to sequestration. Uh, we're facing losing a wonderful elementary school. Even if the fiscal cliff is averted, school funding cuts will continue to happen as Washington tries to pay down the U.S. debt and, frankly, gives lip service to the importance of education while cutting funding that keeps schools properly running. Um, parents are concerned about class sizes. They're concerned that the federal government sees their kids as merely test scores. They're tired of the current climate where teachers are expected to bear the sole blame for the failure of some students in public schools when the real enemy of a good education is poverty and parents who aren't involved. Um, parents want their kids to have more art, music, and physical education in school. Our kids need smaller class sizes, individual attention, and uh, nurturing of the following skills. Critical thinking, problem solving, leadership, agility, adaptation, initiative, entrepreneurism, oral and written communication, curiosity, imagination, and the ability to collaborate and access and analyze information. These are skills they won't learn if teachers are forced to teach to the test. It's easy to blame teachers and um, make a test the sole way of evaluation for teachers and students. It's much harder to solve the real problems, poverty and parents who aren't involved. So we think you're taking the easy way out here. And our kids are more than test scores. And it's not right to evaluate teachers solely by them either. Um, you're asking people to perform well in a climate of fear and that's not conducive to learning or teaching. Um, I've seen some studies done since No Child Left Behind and they've shown that the program helps some kids, uh, poor minority elementary school kids. That's great, as uh, those are the, the kids that need the most help. But why paint everyone with the same brush? Why, do, why try to pit, fit uh, square pegs into round holes? Do you believe, as I do, it's counterintuitive to underfund, understaff, and overtest, and then expect great results? And thanks for being here. So uh, a, a lot there I'll try and answer as much of it as I can. So. You're going to have that question. By the way. <laughs> I'll kick it to you. And I'll, ask you. I'll start at the front end. So we obviously desperately hope sequestration doesn't happen. And that would be an utter disaster for the country. There's just no upside there. It was set up for like mutual self-destruction and it would just be the height of dysfunction if that happened. So I'm hope, I can't promise you it won't happen. I'm very hopeful it won't happen. And again, people on both sides of the aisle understand the devastating consequences for education, for the country, for national security, if they allow their dysfunction to get in the way. And I hope their own self-interest will prevent it. Um, again, as I said in an earlier question, on the funding side, we desperately want to continue to fund. We are thrilled to be able to save a couple hundred thousand teacher jobs through the Recovery Act. Our funding is 8 to 10 percent of the budget. So again, regardless of your politics and ideology, 90 percent of your funding comes at the state and local level. And having your voices heard and looking at political candidates in both parties who want to invest rather than cut, I can't overstate how important that is. We're again, where the president's flatlining the rest of domestic spending, asking for $1.7 billion increase in our budget. So we're trying to be part of the solution, but we are the minority investor. That's just the fact. And uh, my children go to school in the Arlington Public Schools in Virginia, a great system, but we're seeing overcrowding, we're seeing class size increases, and as a parent of two young kids, it's not something any of us want. Do, so that's one piece of the question. On the testing, I think No Child Left Behind is broken. We wanted Congress to fix it. Congress is pretty broken these days. They haven't fixed it. So we're able to partner directly with states and provide some flexibility and relief, Virginia being one of 32, 33 states we're already working with. We have another 10 in the hopper. And we never, ever, ever think one test score defines a teacher, a child, a school, whatever. We always talk about multiple measures. We do think it's important to look at growth and gain, how much a student's improving each year, whether they're gifted or average or special needs or whatever they might be. We want to know are they making progress. But looking at multiple measures to evaluate students, teachers, 
schools, districts, ultimately states, I think is really thoughtful. What you saw under No Child Left Behind was a fixation on one test score. Yeah. What you're seeing the waivers coming from states, I just think is so much more thoughtful. You're seeing folks looking at growth and gain rather than absolute test scores. You see people looking at increases in graduation rates, reductions in dropout rates, increases in college going rates, increases in college going rates without remediation, increases in college going rates and seeing perseverance there. Some folks think this is more complicated. It is a little more complicated. To me, it's much more holistic and comprehensive. And I always say if you have the best third grade test scores in the world but a 50% dropout rate, it's pretty hard to get a job with a third grade test score. So I think the leadership coming from states is moving us in the right direction. We've been thrilled to be a good partner. Ultimately, Congress needs to fix the law and fix it in a bipartisan way. We stand ready to work with them when they decide to get their act together. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. This has been a wonderful discussion. Uh, before I call the meeting uh, to adjourn it, I would like our mayor to make a presentation. Mayor Bowles. Thank you. Good, good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to be here as an adjunct professor here at Virginia Western, as well as the mayor of Roanoke, and to welcome the Secretary of Education and his, and the, um, Ms., uh, Dr. Dan. Um, Messier. Messier uh, here to Roanoke. Um, we are the star city. I don't know whether you know that. It's because we have a star up on the mountain. <laughs> when you come back again, we'll take you up there for a hike or something. Um, the discussion today has been about adult education and <coughs> uh, community college education. Uh, but I wanted you to know, Mr. Secretary, that Roanoke just started a program called the Star City Reads Program for our youngest children. And it, there are four components to it. Number one, we understand that about 80% of a child's brain develops even before kindergarten. And so we're going to begin to emphasize more education for the thousands of young people here in Roanoke uh, so that they are prepared going into kindergarten. Secondly, yes, secondly, uh, we're going to help our immigrants we are a city of over 100 different nationalities. And so we're going to help our immigrants uh, in helping their children read English here in the Roanoke schools. Thirdly, we're expanding our summer reading program. And fourthly, we don't want any ch child uh, to go into the fourth grade without making sure that they meet third grade reading levels. That's very important. And so with that, uh, that's our Star City, uh, Star City Reads program. Uh, we have just competed nationally with the National Civic League Association, and we've become an all-America city for the sixth time. No other city in America has won that award so many times. And so on the occasion of, us being, of you being here in the star of the cities of America with our Star City, C star to city Reads program, I want to present to the Secretary this gold star from Roanoke. Pretty cool. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Again, I want to thank Secretary Duncan for being here. This has been a great day. We've had a great discussion. I appreciate all the questions, and I appreciate the panel and what you've done and your responses. We stand adjourned. Thank you very much.